Hello and welcome to a new jazz music lesson. We will learn how to improvise in a thrilling free jazz ambient style using only the pentatonic scale. We will create a pentatonic technique that opens new doors to a huge world of potential when improvising jazz. We will discover how this pentatonic technique also makes it very easy to connect the left hand voicing and the right hand solo line. Furthermore, we will make some very useful exercises that helps you get the pentatonic techniques under your skin. Now, let us play a little freestyle jazz solo to demonstrate the sound we can make when using the pentatonic techniques we are going to learn in this lesson. Right now we play a solo using only the minor pentatonic scale. And we are using a rather simple technique, linking the left and the right hand together. First, we will learn some basic stuff about this technique. Then we will make some useful exercises. Then we will learn more about this technique and make additional exercises. Then we discuss some music theory. So it will be practice first and theory later on. And in the end, we must of course break the boundaries totally and do something crazy with the stuff we have learned. We will make super patterns and super chords sound landscapes that are awesome and goes beyond the traditions of jazz music. So that will be really fun. Okay, let's get started. With the left hand, we simply make a minor pentatonic hand grip. It could, for example, be the F minor pentatonic hand grip. We have the pinky on the keynote F, and from there we make the F minor pentatonic hand grip with finger 4, 3, 2, and 1. With the right hand, we just duplicate the F minor pentatonic hand grip, having the thumb on the key note, and then we make the rest of the pentatonic scale with finger 2, 3, 4, and 5. So, why do we use the term hand grip? That's because using this technique, no matter what happens, we always place the left hand and the right hand using this particular piano fingering. The benefits doing this will be revealed later on. In another lesson from New Jazz, we also use this hand grip technique. In that lesson we use a three finger hand grip. I will paste a link to that lesson in the description below. In this video, we move on and we just use all five fingers. Later on, we will also play new useful exercises using this pentatonic hand grip. For now, this F pentatonic hand grip is our only improvisation material. So now we can play a little solo using the F pentatonic hand grip. This is 
Very simple, I know. But we will as always start up as simple as possible. And then build on stuff as we move along. Okay. Next step is to move this pentatonic hand grip around in different keys. So we can do the same trick with any other key. For example, the G minor pentatonic scale like this. Or the A minor pentatonic like this. Let's hear the sound when we play around in random pentatonic tonalities. Notice that no matter tonality, I use the same left hand grip and the same right hand grip. So the fingering is the same in every tonality. Okay, if we thin out this very thick left hand pentatonic chord and lift the fourth and second finger, leaving only finger five, three, and one, we simply have a quartal chord consisting of only three notes, each spaced with a perfect fourth. This type of chord you may already know. It can be used in many cases, for example in modal tunes like So What by Miles Davis. So let's play a little solo again. Now we use quartal voicing instead of the more thick pentatonic voicing. But we still think the left hand grip as pentatonic. Now we can just thin out this hand grip in different levels. We can have all five fingers on, making a solid and thick sound. Or maybe four fingers, like this. Or we can make a minor seven structure, like this. Or only three fingers, like this, the quartal voicing. Or like this. So we can make many different sounds with our left hand just by thinning out our pentatonic hand grip. When we leave out some fingers, we actually just have variations of this main pentatonic pattern, hand grip. A very smart thing is that we reuse the same pentatonic scale in the right hand. So I can think the same pattern in both hands. Left hand pentatonic, right hand pentatonic. This is a very easy way of thinking. And when improvising we just love when things are easy and simple. We just don't want to think too much. <laughs> then we can concentrate our mental energy on the music itself and not the techniques. Okay, the first step is to be familiar with the pentatonic hand grip. The following may seem very simple to some of you, but I just like to start from the beginning and then build up our world of music step by step. Later on in this lesson a lot more stuff will come, but we will begin with the beginning. And for those who are experts, it can also be a good thing once in a while to step down the ladder and make some further foundation. So, let's look at exercise 1.1. 1 
With the left hand, we make our thinned out F minor pentatonic hand grip, the quartal chord. And with our right hand, we play the pentatonic hand grip up and down using finger 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So, let's do this exercise very slowly. One, two, three, four. We also need to transpose this exercise to other tonalities as well. Now, let's transpose our pentatonic hand grip up stepwise with semitones. down with semitones. Notice that I use the same fingering in any tonality. That's why I call this pentatonic pattern a hand grip. Because we can use and reuse this hand grip no matter where on the keys we go. The hand grip is always the same. This has some big advantages. It makes things easier for us. We don't have to think too much when playing a solo. We let the simple hand grip do the job in any tonality. Okay, let's speed up this exercise. One, two, one, two, three, four. This is actually a really good exercise for the two weak fingers, finger four and five. If our fingers can't follow the speed, we just have to slow down the exercise again. Everything needs to be exercised from the beginning, starting up in a slow tempo. Relax while you rehearse, have patience and enjoy your work. Okay, exercise 1.1 has a little boring rhythm. So now we introduce exercise 1.2. It is actually exercise 1.1 all over again. Now we have just shifted the rhythm 1 16th note to the left. Let's try to perform this exercise in a slow speed for a start. One, two, three, four. Now, let's also transpose this exercise with semitones, practicing every tonality. This exercise is a little more challenging. Often in jazz we lift the notes to push the music and surprise the audience and lighten up the heavy beats so the music will not be too stiff and clumsy. Okay. Let's speed up this exercise. One, two, one, two, three, four. And 
let's try some random tonalities, because that's also fun. Now you may already hear that even from this very simple exercise and from this simple pentatonic hand grip we can achieve a lot. Listen how we form the music, constantly changing the tonality. Okay, now we are ready for exercise 1.3. This is a little cool lick, using the pentatonic hand grip, making a melodic phrase. Left hand makes the quartal chord. The right hand fingering goes like this. Five, four, two, three. Three, two, three, four, two, one. Now let's play the lick in a very slow tempo. One, two, Three, four. Now let's transpose this lick stepwise up and down the keys. In this way, we practice the hand grip in every tonality. Again, notice that. Wherever we go, we use the same fingering and the same hand grip. This playing technique has some big advantages. We will talk more about that later on in this lesson. Okay, let's speed up the exercise. One. Two, one, two, three, four. Now let's transpose the lick to random tonalities. Can you hear that music is coming to us now? We can get a lot of stuff out of this. Simple pentatonic hand grip, right? But much more is to be revealed. This is just the beginning. But we are starting to get a grip on the basic stuff here. Okay. Having practiced these three rather strict exercises for a while, we should also make a what I call fool around exercise, mixing and playing with all the stuff we have just learned. When we fool around, it could sound like this. Every time I have practiced strict exercises for about 30 minutes, I like to fool around for another 15 minutes. I think this type of exercise is very important. Because this is our chance to incorporate some music into our practice. So this is the having fun exercise. Fun is the most important thing in life. No fun, no music. Fun helps motivation and motivation helps music, right? Okay, now it's time 
to expand our view on this approach and add more thrilling stuff to the exercises. In another lesson from New Jazz, we learned that playing a specific row of minor pentatonic hand grips, we can play, for example, the Dorian mode or any other church mode. I will quickly summarize the technique here, but if you want to learn more, I will paste some relevant links in the description below. Now, here we have a minor pentatonic hand grip with the thumb on F, right? Then we go up a perfect fifth and place the grip with the thumb on C. Same hand grip, just on C. And we go up another fifth and we place the thumb on G and make the hand grip from there. These three positions, each spaced with a perfect fifth, we entitle position one, position two, and position three. The pentatonic hand grip at all these three positions together, we entitle the pentatonic row. In this case, the entire pentatonic row has its starting point on F, because this is the first note in the row, okay? With this row, with this pentatonic row, we can actually play all the church modes, but more about that later. So, what to do with our left hand? Well, that's very simple. We take our pinky and place it on the starting point of the pentatonic row. And in this case, it is the F note. And then we simply play position one, the F pentatonic scale. And then we can thin out the scale, making, for example, the quartal chord. So the left hand plays position one with the pinky on the starting point of the pentatonic row. Now let's jump to the right hand again. The right hand simply imitate the left hand and plays position one. And the right hand can also expand with position two and position three. So the left hand plays position one and the right hand is free to play position one, two or three. Now let's play a little solo using the pentatonic row. Now let's also move the pentatonic row to other starting points than the F note. Notice that the pinky actually manages the entire improvisation. Wherever I place my pinky, I let the pentatonic row start from there. So if my left hand pinky is on the note G, we play position one, the G pentatonic, the quartal chord, and position one again in the right hand, position two, D pentatonic, and position three, A pentatonic. Another example. Let's put the pinky on the note C. Then we got the pentatonic row here. And with the pinky on D, we have the pentatonic row here. So the idea is that we always pay attention to the left hand pinky. Wherever the pinky goes, we let the pentatonic row start from there. Now, this is a really cool technique for improvisation. 
And if you didn't get the idea totally, then don't worry, we will get deeper into this technique right now, doing some exercises. Okay, now we will incorporate this technique into our fingers. So, we must look at the piano fingering and do some exercises with the pentatonic row. So, here we have exercise 2.1. In this exercise, we simply play up and down the pentatonic row with the starting point F. So, Let's start with our left hand chord. We put our left hand pinky on the F note and play the position 1, the F minor pentatonic scale. And then we thin out this pentatonic hand grip to form the quartal chord. With the right hand we also start out playing the position 1 pentatonic hand grip and we play finger 1, 2, 3. But now we already leave position 1 and jump to position 2. So we go under with the thumb to the C note and we are ready for the C pentatonic scale. Then we do the exact same thing, playing finger 1, 2, 3 and we leave position 2, going under with the thumb to the G note and we are ready for position 3, the G minor pentatonic. This scale we play up and down using finger 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Then we go over with the third finger to position 2 and we play 3, 2, 1. And we do the same trick again, going over with the, uh, the third finger to position 1. And again we play finger 3, 2, 1. And we are back home on the F note, the starting point of the pentatonic row. Let's try out this exercise in a very slow tempo for a start. 1, 2, 3, 4. Notice that the specific positions in use are written to the exercise sheet and the duration of the positions is shown with dotted curved lines. Then it is easy to grasp what position we play and when we jump from one position to another. Okay, we should also exercise the pentatonic row in other tonalities, so let's go up a half step. Notice I use the same fingering. I'm shifting between the positions in the exact same way. The pentatonic row with the starting point on F sharp is a little harder to perform, but not impossible at all. We just need to practice this F-sharp row and get used to it. The difficulties we have to overcome are when shifting position. Here from B and under with the thumb to C-sharp. And from F-sharp to G-sharp. These transitions may seem a little awkward. But after some practice, we get used to it. Let me show you. We speed up the tempo and try out the, the F sharp pentatonic row. One, two, one, two, three, four. You see? No problem. Let's make some other difficult tonalities too. So, no matter the tonality, we always use the same pentatonic hand grip. That's the idea of this technique. 
we let the pentatonic hand grip control our improvisation. This can in some tonalities be a little awkward as I showed you, but not impossible at all. And the benefits of letting a single hand grip control our improvisation are enormous. Using the same fingering and the same pentatonic hand grips makes it so much easier for us to change tonality quickly and repeat and vari variate phrases without thinking too much. And that's the really great advantage of this technique. Okay, we must move on. So here comes exercise 2.2, variant 1. This exercise presents a little fancy lick that comes in six variants. Our left hand always plays position 1, in this case uh, the F pentatonic. In the right hand we play position 1 and position 2. Let's look at the fingering. We start with position 1, playing finger 5, 4, 2, 3. And then we move to position 2, using finger 1, 2, 5, 4, 2, 3. Let's play the lick very slow for a start. 1, 2, 3. Four. And let's transpose the lick stepwise up and down the keys. And again, same fingering, same hand grip, no matter tonality. Right? Okay, let's speed up this exercise. One, two, one, two, three, four. And let's choose some random starting points for the pentatonic row. When using the pentatonic hand grip technique, we can play this lick with the same piano fingering all the time. Then it is very easy for us to repeat the phrase in other tonalities as well. Our brain quickly translates the lick because the fingering we have rehearsed can be reused wherever we go. I think that repeating phrases at different places on the keyboard is a very cool thing to do when playing a jazz solo. Okay, let's look at exercise 2.2, variant 2. This is a lick with the, the exact same rhythm and fingering as variant 1. So, what is the difference? Well, instead of playing position 1 and 2, we now play position 1 and 3. So, we play finger 5, 4, two, three, and then finger one on position three, the G pentatonic, 
And we play finger one, two, five, four, two, three. The lick sounds like this. One, two, one, two, three, four. This variant two lick sounds very different from the variant one. But still we use the same piano fingering, the same pentatonic hand grip. So having rehearsed variant one, it is actually very straightforward forward for us to learn this variant two. The only thing that differs is that we now play position one and three instead of one and two. Now let's try to mix the two variations we have learned. So we can easily variate a lick or phrase using different positions from the pentatonic row because we reuse the same pentatonic hand grip and the same piano fingering, right? Now, let's also transpose this lick uh, and its two variations to different tonalities. mixing a lot of things actually. We play two different variations of the lick and at the same time we transpose the lick by repeating the lick in different tonalities. All this we do with a single hand grip. In other words, we play something rather complicated, but in a very simple way. When being confidential with the pentatonic hand grip, this stuff is actually rather easy to perform, because I only use a single hand grip. This lick has in total six variations, by the way. I have written them all down in a little compendium along with all the other exercises we have learned in this lesson. I will paste a link to the PDF document in the description below. But it's also up to you to come up with your own favorite licks that you like using the pentatonic row. In this way, you create your own sound using the grips. So, create and rehearse a fancy lick. Find the variations of that lick. Rehearse these variations and transpose the variations to all tonalities as well. And when you are ready, mix everything together. The variations and the tonalities. This is really fun work and day by day you will feel that your improvisation develops and improves. Well, now it's time for our fool around exercise. So let's play the pentatonic row in random tonalities. So now we just fool around trying to experiment with the pentatonic row. I'm not playing a particular lick, I'm 
just fooling around. In the left hand, we always play position one. And in the right hand, we are free to play position one, two, or three. It is now up to us how to form the improvisation by mixing the three positions, making licks, small motifs, and longer phrases on the fly. Sometimes we repeat a phrase we like and uh, in uh, different tonalities. Again, notice that our left hand pinky always decides the starting note of the pentatonic row. So, by placing the pinky here, we got the pentatonic row here. By placing the pinky here, we got the pentatonic row here. The three positions in our right hand, we can freely mess around. I don't have to play them in an ordered row like this. We can mix them around as we wish. So, this fool around solo is actually very simple. Of course, we need to practice and practice and practice. But when having the pentatonic grips under our skin, then things start to get very easy. Because we can reuse the hand grip for so many purposes. Okay, now we must move on and find out what kind of scales we can play using the pentatonic row. So, it is time for some very useful music theory about the church modes and the pentatonic row that will make all this stuff we have learned very useful. The pentatonic row is actually a very strong constellation because with this pentatonic row we can actually play all seven church modes. Now, if we define the starting point of the pentatonic row to be our keynote, then we will actually play the Dorian scale. Let's make an example. Let's say we want to play the D Dorian scale. As you may know, the D Dorian scale is all the white keys. Now we want to play the D Dorian using the pentatonic row. Then we simply define the D note to be our key note in the bass. And then we play the pentatonic row also with the starting note D, like this. And then we play the D Dorian scale, or the white keys, right? Now, here comes the golden tips. So hang on. This gets pretty advanced, but if we can grasp this, we will just move a giant step up the ladder when improvising using the modes. We can play all the church modes by moving the pentatonic row to different starting points relative to the bass note. Now, the trick is that each of the starting points of the pentatonic row must be located on a Dorian scale with the Dorian keynote in the bass. So, if I play, for example, the D keynote in the bass, 
We can play all the church modes just by moving the starting point, point of the pentatonic row to all the white D Dorian keys. Let me exemplify this. We just need to write down all the church modes in correct order. That will help us a lot. Yes. And let's for example locate the D Dorian scale. All the white keys, right? If we want to play D Dorian using the pentatonic row, we simply let the pentatonic row start from the keynote D, like this. Here we got the D Dorian scale. Now let's move downhill to the next white D Dorian key. That's the C note. We keep the Dorian key note D in the bass and now we let the pentatonic row start on C and we simply play the next mode in the church mode order and that's the D Phrygian mode. If we move the starting note of the pentatonic row to the next white key on the D Dorian scale, then we play the D Lydian mode. Still, we keep the Dorian key note D in the bass. And if we move the starting note to the next white D Dorian note A, then we play D Mixolydian. And after Mixolydian comes D Aeolian. D Locrian. And finally D Ionian. Do you get the idea? Let's make another example. Now we want to locate all the church modes in C using the pentatonic row. So, we locate the C Dorian. So, we have C in the bass. If we start the pentatonic row on the Dorian keynote C, we got the C Dorian. Moving one step down the C Dorian scale, we got the C Phrygian. One step down C Lydian. C Mixolydian. C Aeolian. C Locrian. Finally, C Ionian. So, we use a Dorian scale in a specific tonality as basis. We play the Dorian keynote in the bass. We move the pentatonic row around always with its starting point on one of the keys from this specific Dorian scale. And then we are able to play all the church modes. I hope you get the idea. Else you are always welcome to ask questions in the comments below. I will always try to answer as best I can. But remember, maybe it's night here in Denmark. Or maybe I'm at work. Or maybe I just have to think. So sometimes it takes some hours for me to answer. So I hope you have some patience with me. Now, let's go back to the D Dorian scale as our basic scale and play a little solo using all the church modes. Now we use only the D Dorian white keys as starting points for our pentatonic row. And we let the bass note stay fixed on the D note. 
and we just fool around, shifting between the church modes randomly. This gives us a special sound of all the modes together. No matter on which wide key we start our pentatonic row, we are totally sure to play a clean diatonic scale without chromatic clusters or ugly things like that. So, if we want to play a nice diatonic solo, we just stick to the church modes. And having D in the bass, we just let the pentatonic row start on one of the D Dorian white keys. Then we are safe. We play totally diatonic now using the modes. In another lesson from New Jazz, we learn a lot more about the church modes and the pattern that they have in common. I will paste a link to that lesson in the description below. I have also made a lesson building a circle of church modes, a tool to look up all the modes. This tool may also become handy for you. I will also link to that lesson in the description below. Okay, everything does not have to be diatonic and nice. So now it is time to do something rather crazy and wild. Something that goes beyond normal music terms. It's a super cool trick that creates a huge, titanic and great sound. We will actually stretch the diatonic sound. I like to think on this technique as when we launch a future space rocket that flies close into light speed, so fast that it bends the space-time. In the same way, we will also bend the modes and stretch the sound as it goes up the register. The nice thing is that it is actually very easy for us to launch this rocket, because we don't have to learn something new. We just reuse the pentatonic hand grip that we already know and we just expand the pentatonic row. But now we are going into space. So grab on to something. Let's pick the D note as our bass note. And let's play the D Dorian scale using the pentatonic row starting on D. And here comes the trick. We just expand our pentatonic row by adding new positions following the same pattern. Each position are spaced with a perfect fifth. Sounds like this. Wow, right? What a sound. So now we play position one. Two, three, and a perfect fifth above position four, and a perfect fifth above position five, and six. We can keep on until we run out of keys. This technique, of course, makes some huge non diatonic dissonances, but the dissonances are spread out on the register from the very deep end to the very top of the piano. So in my ears I do not hear any sharp dissonances, but 
Instead, I hear some kind of Dorian stretch. It's like we are standing in the top of the piano, pulling the Dorian to be even brighter in the top. Listen. Let's look into this. Here we have the Dorian scale using the pentatonic row, right? Now we add position 4. And then we suddenly play the major third with finger 4. Instead of the minor third, we have further down in position 1, finger 2. So we have position 4 major and position 1 minor. So moving up to position 4, we actually brighten the Dorian sound. If we move further up to position 5, we now reach the major 7th note with finger 4, the C sharp. So we have brightened the sound even more. The more dark Dorian minor 7 note we find much further down in position 1 finger 5 and position 2 finger 2. If we play position 6, we hit the G sharp and we actually augment the 4th step, like in the Lydian scale. A very bright sound. Being really crazy going to position 7. We augment the key note itself. Here we reach the D sharp. But my theory is that the key note in the bass and the augmented key note in the top are so far away from each other that it sounds rather logical for us. Because we have built up to this note making a huge pentatonic structure containing seven similar patterns all the way up. So actually we kind of expect this augmented key note. Let's try to use our ears. Now we start from the D position 1. Going up, 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 up. And when going up to position 7, we do not expect this, the keynote D. Ah, wrong! On the way up, we alter our mind and we actually expect the augmented keynote. Let us play the superstructure correctly, and I'm sure you can hear what I mean. Position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Ah, that's better, right? D sharp. Making these super patterns, we do of course need to play the positions in a ordered row and not mixing the positions together as we have done earlier. We need to spread out the sound to avoid the dissonant clashes. So by playing the positions in order, we will avoid the clashes and instead we will hear the stretch effect of the sound. Listen. The rocket is leaving Earth. Goodbye Earth. <laughs> Making those super patterns, I like to leave out the third finger in every position. Then we get a super chord pattern built up with thirds all the way up like this. When leaving out the third finger, we clean up the sound, I think, making a more a more like a huge stretching chord. Notice that this super chord contains only perfect fifths merged into each other. No diminished or augmented fifths. 
So it's a very consonant pattern. Maybe that's why we are allowed to augment the notes on the way up. The pattern makes the sound logic with its very clean and nice perfect fifths. So it's like we are actually expecting the chord to be stretched. If we do not and break the pattern, it actually sounds wrong. So with a strong pattern, we can move away from diatonic music and into a new world of sound. And that's just so exciting. I just love when we make music that goes beyond traditions. Music should develop and not be a static phenomenon. We should not always hang on to traditions and just play what everybody already has been playing for centuries. We have to push the music and make brand new music. Now, let's try to augment some of the other modes as well using these super chords. What about the D Phrygian mode? Having the D note in the bass, we start the pentatonic row from the C note and play position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Mm, nice! I just love these expansions. Stretching the Phrygian mode makes a completely different sound than stretching the Dorian mode. But both works great, I think. Okay, what about stretching the D Ionian mode? Having the D note in the bass, we start the pentatonic row from the E note and play position 1, 2, and seven. What a bright chord based on the Ionian mode. Now, let's play a little solo. Random shifting between the modes in D. Stretching some of the modes by playing positions above position three. So, the row starts up in a given mode, and then we stretch that mode in the top. So, notice, this is not traditional diatonic music. We are stretching the diatonic scales and we are stretching the traditions of music, approaching a new sound based on patterns. In another video from New Jazz, Erik Fransen, Theo Prehn and I play an ambient modal free jazz song. In this song I make use of all the techniques explained in this lesson. I will paste a link to the song in the description below. I surely hope you will enjoy the music. Well, time to say goodbye and I hope you have enjoyed this journey into the world of improvised music. The best and warm regards from your music teacher, Oliver Prehn. <laughs>